OK, so hello, everybody. I apologize for the late start. I got locked out when I tried to go to the bathroom. So, Name of this session is Kicking Imposter Syndrome in the Head. And uh, just to start off with, how many people know what imposter syndrome is? OK. How many people feel like you have either a touch or a really bad case of imposter syndrome? Awesome. OK, so um, actually, let's get those hands back up again. Everybody look around the room. You see those hands up? You are not alone. And if that is the most important thing you take from this talk, it is still really important. I gave this talk down at Linux Conf Australia this year. And uh, when the sea of hands went up, and everybody looked around, and everybody just went, whoa, it's not just me. So it was a nice, really illustrative moment there. So imposter syndrome, what is the technical definition of imposter syndrome? It's a psychological phenomenon in which people are unable to internalize their accomplishments. Despite external evidence of their competence, those with the syndrome remain convinced they are frauds and do not deserve the success they have achieved. Proof of success is dismissed as luck, timing, or as a result of deceiving others into thinking they are more intelligent and competent than they believe themselves to be which is a lot of words to say what imposter syndrome really is, which is the sense that any minute, oh crap, they're going to find out I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> and it doesn't matter who they are. You know, there, there's a lot of they out there. And hang on a second, I want to just turn this volume down a little because I'm getting a little bit of feedback. Um, OK, do we have a volume on this? I don't think there is. OK, OK. So, we're going to talk about a couple things here. We're going to talk about diagnosing your imposter syndrome. We're going to talk about how you can uh, work on reducing your feelings of imposter syndrome. And we can talk about how you, as a community leader, as somebody uh, who your community looks up to, or even just as a community member, how you can help other people overcome their imposter syndrome. We'll start with a quick diagnostics. Um, okay. If somebody says to you, well, you know, you and John and Jane, you guys are all so good at what you do, and it's great, and it's awesome. Do you say, you know, well, thanks. You know, I really enjoy working with them. We have a lot of fun together, whatever. Do you think, well, they're good at this, and I'm just really good at pretending, and somebody's going to find that out any minute now. Yeah. Somebody says to you, well, you know, I always look up to you as a role model. It's awesome. Thank you. Do you say, well, you know, thanks. I'm really glad I can help inspire you. Or do you say, well, you wouldn't look up to me if you knew how bad at this I really was. <laughs> I've got some knowing laughter going on here, so it's nice to know I'm not the only one, you know? Somebody says, comes to you and says, you know, you're always so good at solving problems for other people. You're literally making me itch right now. <laughs> <laughs> that familiar, huh? <laughs> Somebody who, you know, you're so good at solving problems for other people, do you say, you know, well, thanks, you know, we all help each other out when we can. Some people help me out, I help other people out. Or does somebody say, you know, you're so good at solving problems for other people and you think, well, except for that one time and the one mistake and then the other one and then that really bad one that like destroyed everything and then they, and everybody had to clean up my mistake. And, and did... Okay, we need to take a moment to breathe because like just seeing that slide stressed me out. <laughs> Just writing that slide stressed me out so much that I had to put a picture of my cat with a ball of yarn <laughs> in the presentation. This is Gabe. He doesn't uh, you know, really care whether or not I know what I'm doing as long as I feed him on time. <laughs> so why does imposter syndrome suck? I mean, it's pretty obvious that it sucks, but there's a couple of really concrete reasons why it sucks and why should we should be working on getting rid of it. And first off, it makes it impossible to take pride in your work. If you wind up feeling that uh, like everything you're doing, you're a big fake and a big fraud, and any success that you've achieved is completely coincidental, it means that when you do have those successes, you can't actually take pride in it, and you can't feel a sense of accomplishment because you feel like it was luck or accident. It means that it's impossible for you to admit that you don't know something. And uh, I, mean, I don't know about you guys, I don't know everything. Um, you know, this is a shock to many people because I like to pretend that I do. But uh, you know, if you're worried that people are going to figure out that you're a fraud and a fake, you can't actually admit that you don't know something because then that will be taken as proof that you're a fraud and a fake. So you feel like you always have to put up that sense of, I know everything. 
means that uh, other people around you have problems having perspective. Because if you always are trying to look like everything you do is super easy and uh, you're never going to confess to struggling and you're never going to confess that uh, you, know, you don't know something, it means that other people can't calibrate their perceptions of things as well. So it's not just damaging to you, it's damaging to the community around you. And finally, it makes you feel like crap. I don't know about you, I don't want to feel like crap in my hobby. I don't want to feel like crap in my job. I don't want to feel like I don't know what I'm doing. So it's important to work on your imposter syndrome so that these various things don't keep happening to you. So let's start with talking about how you can help yourself overcome your own imposter syndrome. And uh, you, know, you always start with yourself and then move outward. And step zero is you just talk about it. The fact that we are here right now having this conversation is a really great perspective check. That's why I asked you all to look around and see how many hands were up at the beginning of the talk. Because if you're left there thinking like you're the only one who feels like this, then that's just gonna make it worse. If you look around and you see, well, it's normal for people to feel like they don't know what they're doing. It's normal for people to feel like they're out of their depth. It's normal for that to happen. The more we talk about this, the more that becomes an accepted part of the community and the culture. Second, watch your language. Um, some ideas are self-reinforcing. And what I mean like that about this is when you are talking to other people in email, in IRC, when you're communicating about the project, um, there are a couple of things that you want to watch for. Just and only and other little minimizers. Um, if you're talking about a patch that you did or some documentation that you contributed or whatever, and somebody says, uh, you know, well, thank you for doing that, is the first thing out of your mouth, well, it was just some documentation. Or it was only a little patch. The more that you uh, reduce your own accomplishments and minimize your, the, the things that you've done, the more you talk your brain into believing that it really was nothing special. And uh, if you talk your brain into believing that it was nothing special, then you wind up feeling like it was nothing special, and that uh, screws you over for calibration there. I think, I don't know if, other qualifiers like that, um, how many times when you're in email and you're trying to figure out what bit you should be doing next on your project, and you have a bunch of you and you're all contributing to the thread and you're all talking awesomely about uh, how this should be done, who are you going to listen more to? The person who comes in and says, we need to do this, 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 and this. Or are you going to listen to the person who comes in and says, well, I think maybe we should go with this and that, and uh, I don't know if we should do that next. Or, um, so by using that kind of language, you kind of um, are signaling to others that you have less confidence in your contributions. And it also uh, talks your own brain into believing that you have less confidence in your own contributions. I'm not a real whatever. Um, this used to happen to me at the very early days of the Dream With project. We'd be talking about something and I'd be saying, well, you know, all right, we need to do this, this, and this. But I'm not a real developer, so maybe I'm wrong. And, uh, you know, the more I said that, the more I convinced myself that I really wasn't a real developer. Should. And this is the one that, you know, it, it's a little fuzzy here because sometimes you do want to talk about what you should be doing. You want to talk about your community should be welcoming to others. Your community should be working on this. Uh, our project goals for this year should be whatever. But should is one of those little words that's insidious and it creeps in and creeps in until you talk yourself into believing you should be doing more than you actually are. You talk yourself into believing, well, I should have had that finished already. You say, I should have understood this already. And if you wind up convincing yourself and putting obligations on yourself like that, you're going to wind up feeling like you're not living up to them. Watching for these little signifiers and warning signs in your email and your communications or whatever, it's really hard. As a matter of fact, it's so hard that I recommend you repurpose the idea of the swear jar to be the self-deprecating language jar. And every time you know, one of your emails comes back to you, uh, bounced or back from the mailing list, and you're reading it over, you look at it, look at it like somebody else wrote it. 
and saying, you know, well, if somebody else wrote this, would I be calling them out on minimizing their contributions? If somebody else wrote this, would I be calling them out on, uh, you know, uh, talking down and minimizing themselves? If so, put a quarter in the jar. You'd really be surprised how fast that adds up. Second, teach what you know, even if you don't think you don't know it, especially if you think you don't know it. And this is the kind of advice that everybody always looks at me like, what are you talking about? Because if I think I don't know something, why should I be teaching it to somebody else? What happens when you're teaching somebody newer to the project, newer to the language, newer to the idea than you are, you find yourself instinctively organizing what you know in order to present it to somebody else. I didn't know how much I knew about imposter syndrome until I sat down to structure these slides. <laughs> So when you're teaching somebody, the, the best person to teach any new concept is somebody who's just learned that concept themselves uh, because they're the ones who have uh, just been through all of the little tricks and traps and they remember them. Somebody who's been programming in Perl for 15 years is going to like breeze through the steps that complete newcomers look at and go, oh my god, I have no idea what you just did there. So uh, sometimes having an advanced beginner teaching absolute beginners is the best idea. Um, and if nothing else, it will prove to you that you actually know way more than you think you knew. Question corrections. Um, this is another one of those bits of advice that you look at and you just go, OK, well, what does she mean there? Um, I'm sure that everybody has participated in a project mailing list, an IRC channel or whatever, where when you do something and you present it and you say, here, I made this patch or whatever. And the first thing that anybody says is, well, that's great, but you use tabs instead of spaces. <laughs> um, or, you know, well, okay, you did this huge epic patch and it adds this feature that we've wanted for a really long time, but I don't like the color that you made it. Does everybody know the story about the bike shed? <laughs> For those who don't know it, it's bikeshed.org. And the idea is that if you've got this big, huge project, like a nuclear power plant or whatever, by the time the plans get to committee, everybody figures, well, a nuclear power plant is huge. I can't wrap my brain around it. Surely somebody has checked these plans by now. So I'm just going to let them go. With a bike shed, it's something small, it's something concrete, it's something that everybody has seen before. And so they feel a lot more comfortable in saying, well, you know, okay, here are your plans for the bike shed. I don't like the color that you painted it. So a lot of times people just want to come in and put their own stamp on things or they want to, uh, you know, the, the somewhat crass way of putting it is they want to pee on it and, you know, claim it for themselves. Um, those kind of corrections are really demoralizing and you shouldn't do them to other people uh, who are new or people who are less confident. But when people do them to you, you just like roll with it. You know, just because somebody says this should be written in a different language doesn't mean it actually should. Just because somebody who's more experienced than you offers a correction doesn't mean that your work is less good. It doesn't mean that your work is less qualified, and it doesn't mean that you're less competent. Sometimes it just means that somebody saw an opportunity and wanted to lecture about it a little. Ask questions. And this is another point that seems counterintuitive. But here are your two scenarios. You come into a project. You're ready to do something. You think, uh, well, I'm, I've got 90% of this, and then there's just like this little thing that's driving me nuts, and I can't figure it out. If you figure, well, anybody else would be able to figure this out just automatically, so I'm going to just like click around and try and find some information, and I'll fake it, and I'll go and Google the, the things that I'm using, and maybe I'll figure it out eventually. Um, you wind up spending like four or five times as much time as you would if you just went up to somebody and say, hey, I'm stuck on this last 10% of this. Can you give me a hand? And a lot of times you'll find that if you do uh, have this one subroutine that you can't figure out or whatever, and you go to somebody and you say, hey, I'm having a little problem with, the, with this module. Can you, uh, you know, talk me through it or whatever? Sometimes you'll find that what the response is, oh, yeah, absolutely everybody has problems with that one. Um, we really just haven't gotten around to finishing the documentation yet. Let me talk you through it. Even if they don't, you know, 
still, it's better to ask early than to sit there and just like work yourself up into uh, being uncertain about things. You waste a lot less time and the more important part is that you waste a lot less time feeling like a failure. Ask for perspective checks from a friend. Um, you, this obviously needs a trusted friend. It needs somebody who's got a good sense of your accomplishments and your abilities and the project culture. Uh, but if you have somebody that you can go to and say, you know, was that out of line? Or um, some, somebody to say, is it just me or is this really confusing? Um, having somebody to just like go to them and say, give me a perspective check here. It really helps to contextualize what you're thinking and what you're feeling. And it keeps you from, again, just like wandering lost in the woods and feeling like you are the only person in the world who feels like this. List your accomplishments. This is the one that people have the most trouble with. <laughs> people have so much trouble with this that I actually started on my personal blog. Every Monday, I put up a post <laughs> and I say, I want you all to make a list of everything you did last week that you're proud of and I want you to put it in public and I want you to put it on the record of what you did and what you're proud of. And it started out as just like this casual thing and now I've been doing it for like four or five years now. I haven't counted up how long it's been. And we have people who come in every Monday and say, this is what I did last week and it was huge for me. Um, you know, everybody makes their own um, definition of proud and everybody makes their own definition of accomplishment but just having it on the record of what you did means that when your brain starts telling you that you're worthless you haven't accomplished anything that you haven't uh, you know gotten anything done etc you can turn around and you can point at it and you go you know you stupid jerk brain I did get something done and here's the proof practice accepting compliments this is also really hard. This is another case where you need that trusted friend. And it sounds like really awkward and you're going to be feeling very awkward at first, but you need to practice just saying thank you when someone compliments you. I can guarantee you that if you come up to me for the rest of the conference and say, I really liked your talk on imposter syndrome, my first impulse will be to say, oh, thanks, I just threw it together like right before the conference. Is that true? Actually, yes, I was finishing my slides before the keynote this morning, but uh, <laughs> yes, in the finest, in the finest tradition. Exactly. Exactly. And see, that's another case, you know, for a new speaker who's just finishing their slides right before, uh, you know, hearing people say, yes, I did that too, can be really helpful. That's what I mean by perspective check. But accepting compliments. If you don't accept compliments gracefully, and if your first impulse is to minimize the thing that somebody is complimenting you about, not only are you convincing your brain that what you did was not worthy of being complimented, you're also convincing the other person that what they wanted to compliment was not worthy of being complimented. So you're not only screwing up your perspective, you're screwing up their perspective too. So it's really hard to accept compliments gracefully. I mean, I've been practicing it for, uh, God, about like seven or eight years now since I first really started becoming aware of it. And I still have to choke back the impulse to minimize at first. But work on it because it's really important. So we talked a little bit about how you, know, you can help yourself overcome your own imposter syndrome. How about if you're in a position of power in your community, uh, if people look up to you in your community, um, and you, you know, you're standing there thinking, well, why should people look up to me? Because I'm a total failure and I'm faking all of this. But, you know, people do look up to people who have been in the community longer. People do look up to people who have been accomplishing things for longer than they have. And even if you feel like you're a fake and a failure, you're an inspiration for somebody else. So here are some things you can do in order to help other people with their own imposter syndrome. First of all, talk about the issue. You know, the more we discuss it, the more important that it gets that people hear this is normal. On our project to dream with, um, we have uh, something like 65% people who have never programmed before. Um, and one of the important things that we do with them is saying, you know, 
I don't actually know the answer to your question, but I'll go and find it out. Um, one of the important things that we do is we say, um, you know, I'm feeling really uncertain and uh, like I don't know anything going on here, so can somebody say something nice about me or whatever? Uh, you know, those, those little ego boosts and things like that. And just by talking about imposter syndrome, it means that the people on our project are aware that it's a thing and they can start looking for uh, signs of it in themselves and they can start working to, to overcome it. So there are some more concrete things you can do. First off is take questions seriously. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of Hacker School. It's a three month intensive project um, for teaching people how to program. And they have two rules that I think are fabulous, fabulous rules and should be applied in absolutely every single open source development project across the board. Their two rules are really simple. One, you're not allowed to fake surprise you know, if somebody asks a question like, well, how do you do thus and such? Um, you're not allowed to turn around and go, what, you mean you've never heard of thus and such? You know, if somebody asks, well, um, you know, uh, well, I know about uh, Debian Linux, but what's this Ubuntu thing? You're not allowed to turn around and say, what do you mean you've never heard of Ubuntu? You know, you're not allowed to pretend like you're shocked that somebody doesn't know about something. And the second rule is that um, they've put a blanket prohibition on what they call well actually statements, which is, <laughs> yeah, the laughter from the audience says you all know what I mean. Um, you, you go and you uh, make a presentation or you um, answer somebody else's question or you write a project plan or something and somebody comes along and says, well, actually, and then nitpicks like that one thing you said in passing down to like component atoms and, you know, wants to talk about all of the exceptions and all of the variations. And that's incredibly demoralizing to hear. And by placing a blanket prohibition on that kind of behavior, you uh, basically say that if something that somebody says is 90% of the way there, you're not going to sweat that 10%. Um, you know, we are nerds. I mean, I don't, I'm speaking for everybody here, but I think just the attendance here is probably a good signifier. We're nerds. We like to argue about the details. Uh, I mean, how many flame wars have we gotten into about the, uh, the little tiny nitty gritty things? And those things are important, but they're not necessarily important first. They're not necessarily important for a beginner. They're not necessarily important for somebody who's just started out. Hold those corrections and those nitpicks and those, uh, you know, well, actually, you know, hold those for later um, because bringing them up at first can really make somebody feel like they don't know what they're talking about. Two, make mistakes publicly. And this is more important for people who are in a position of power or authority in a community, but especially for anybody who has any kind of seniority or has been around for a while. If you make mistakes in public and if you confess to your mistakes and say, yeah, I totally screwed that one up, oops, sorry, the more you do that, the more you're creating an environment where it's okay for people to make mistakes. And it's okay for people to admit that they don't know what they're doing. Uh, you know, Mark over here is laughing because, uh, you know, what was it, like two weeks ago, uh, Mar Mark is the, uh, the person who, um, my co-owner, my co-founder, does all of our technology, runs our servers, he's our DevOps guy. He discovered that, um, what was it, like two months ago? Yeah, about two months ago. About two months ago, he restarted a machine and forgot to bring up our memcache instance, which meant that for two months we were running without any caching on the back end. And for two months, he kept tearing out his hair going, why the hell is the site so slow? And, you know, when you discover something like that, your temptation is to just go, nobody saw that. I'm just going to pretend that never happened because that really makes me look like a moron. But if you do that in public, you know, your new contributors and your other people in your community are going to look at that and go, well, if they can screw up like that, <laughs> then it's okay if I mess up. You didn't mention that we bought new hardware then. <laughs> 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 I wasn't going to get into that part. <laughs> it's nice hardware. <laughs> <laughs> we'll use it a 
eventually. <laughs> okay, three, um, call out things that other people accomplish, especially if you know that it's something that they worked really hard on. Um, we have somebody in our project who just sat down with all of our test files, which are horrendously out of date and have very poor coverage, but you know, that's always the way of things. Um, and she sat down with all our test files and put our standard project header on each one, including what the test was supposed to be testing, where the code came from, because we're actually a code fork. We forked from LiveJournal about five years ago. So some of our code uh, was originally written from LiveJournal and some of it was written by us. So she sat down and figured out you know, where each of the tests came from and who wrote the code. She put headers on it. Um, she figured out which tests were failing and left notes in the code uh, above each of those particular tests. It was an amazing amount of work. I think she probably spent about 20 or 30 hours going through the whole thing. And it was like, I mean, it was really tedious, annoying, fiddly work that nobody else wanted to do. And she said, well, actually, I find that kind of tedious, annoying, fiddly work soothing. So I'm going to go and I'm going to do all that. And when uh, the code reviewer reviewed that code um, and accepted the pull request, she said, thank you for doing this. This is uh, an amazing amount of work. And I really appreciate it. And it's going to make things so much easier in the future. And that one little that one line on when accepting the pull request, when I asked our contributors, hey guys, you know, what do we do that's really good at helping you guys fight your imposter syndrome? She called that out and she said, I actually saved that email in my email so that I can go back and look at it when I'm feeling like I'm not really doing much or doing anything. It takes you like two minutes at most to say to somebody, that was awesome. Thank you for doing it. Or just say, you know, thank you. That was really helpful. And it's going to be uh, you know, so awesome going forward to have this done or whatever. And uh, having, that, having said that to somebody really helps them feel like they're contributing. And it helps them feel like they have something valuable to add. Four, document the things on your project that everybody knows. <laughs> Everybody knows that you have to uh, call this particular method with uh, this type of caller instead of the other type of caller, or else you get a weird error message that's totally unexplanatory. Yeah. Everybody knows it, but you know it because you've been bitten by it before. And if it's not documented, then the newcomer or the person who's uh, you know, feeling shy and awkward and less experienced, they're going to hit that error message that's undocumented, and they're just going to go, Oh god, it's undocumented, which means that everybody else should know this, which means that the fact that I don't know this means that I'm stupid. And they're going to go away. So uh, what we do is we have a wiki. And the, the wiki has like a bunch of pages that are just like, here's this one thing that everybody knows about the code. And you know, if you're using this method, you have to call it like this. Or if you're changing uh, this string, you have to change it this way. And we actually have some people in our project channel who uh, like that tedious sort of fiddly documentation. Um, so if you have people like that in your project, first of all, chain them to your IRC channel so that they can never leave. But second of all, task them to basically say, whenever somebody gets an answer on the fly, on the mailing list, on your IRC channel, in a pull request, whatever, um, whenever somebody takes the time to explain something that's undocumented, Take that explanation and drop it in the wiki. You know, take that explanation and put it in a code comment. Um, if people keep tripping over how do you change this one thing and somebody has to explain it on the mailing list or an IRC like once, twice a week, just pull out that explanation and document it. And that way people won't get stuck on it and feel like, oh my god, you know, I'm totally lost. That means I'm stupid. And finally, this is a really, really big one. And this is a matter of project culture that you're going to have to start working on now, and you're going to have to keep working on. And you're probably going to need some buy-in, and uh, sometimes that's really hard to get. But you have to make it no big deal at all to ask for help or to admit defeat. And the reason for that is, if you make it so that people can just say, you know what, I got in totally over my head about this, um, you know, 
will you come and sit down and explain this to me? If they can do that without feeling like they're losing face, if they can do that without feeling like uh, people are thinking that they're stupid, um, if that's an accepted part of your project culture, then people will be more willing to do that. And that means that they aren't just going to sit there and quietly like huddle behind their desk and be like, well, I'll figure it out eventually, right? And then when they don't figure it out, they'll just kind of drift slowly away, feeling like everybody else knows these things, and that means they're stupid. If you make it OK for people to admit that they're over their head, if you make it OK for people to, to ask for help, to admit that they're, they're defeated or whatever, it actually has the effect that people are going to be far more willing to stretch a little further than they thought they could. Because if they know that there's no social stigma to failing, if there's no social stigma to getting something wrong or to needing a correction or to having a pull request that's not perfect the first time, if they know that that's OK on your project, then they're going to be willing to do it. And they're going to try things that they didn't think they could do. And a lot of the times, they're going to try it, and they're going to realize that, well, actually, I can do this. And that is like the most amazing thing for helping other people get past their imposter syndrome, which is showing them that, yes, they really can do this. You know, showing them that, yes, it's OK that you need to stop and ask for help with this one undocumented little thing that nobody uh, has any idea what's going on. It's OK to say, well, you know, the, this part of the code is like we, the shambling horror. Uh, we have, uh, what is it, 350,000 lines? Yeah, no. 350,000 lines of legacy Perl that was mostly written from 1998 to 2004. It's only very recently that we even made it work on Perl 510, uh, which is really old for those of you who don't know Perl. There are bits of the code base that we um, make ritual warding gestures every time anybody <laughs> comes near. And uh, we've nicknamed one part of the code the shambling horror of the deep. <laughs> And by actually, by saying that, it frees people up so much. Because now all of a sudden it's not, oh my god, I don't look, I, I look at this and I don't understand it. I must be stupid. Now it's, oh my god, I look at this and I don't understand it. Guys, please come laugh at this with me. <laughs> so by doing that, you actually encourage people to step out of their comfort zones a little. And it really helps. So I want to do a little bit of audience participation here. Um, and this is a little beyond question and answer. Um, I'll try and save some time for Q&A. But before we do Q&A, I did this, uh, this talk down in, um, at LinuxConf Australia this year in Canberra. And one of the things that we did that was amazingly helpful and just incredibly powerful was I invited the audience to contribute things that their own imposter syndrome has been telling them and then asked everybody else in the room who also agreed with that statement or had also felt that way at some point in the past to raise their hands. And by looking around and seeing that, yes, you're not the only person who feels that way. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but just from me standing up here looking at the, the sea of hands, it was incredibly motivating. So I'd like to uh, you know, ask people to, to contribute some of their own little imposter syndrome demons. And I will start off with, um, um, Oh my god, I have absolutely no idea what I'm doing with this code. And it's taking me way too long to figure it out. And therefore, that means that I'm stupid. OK, yeah, take a look around. Hands up, guys. Come on, come on. Look around you. You are not the only one who feels that way. <laughs> Does anybody else want to contribute something and make sure to see that they are not alone? Work around, other good people. yeah, I find it extremely intimidating to work around other good people. Oh, yes, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, yes? Well, I don't know, this is probably only in my culture. I don't know about here in the United States, but we tend to be very deferential. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for example, we tend to give more respect to older, more established editors and you, uh, like, or more established people, and you'll feel, I, I will never be, you know, him, or I will never be her. I will never be this incredibly established, respected. Look around, 
person. <laughs> yeah. Still, like, seriously, look around you. <laughs> like, some of the people whose hands are up, I bet, are the established, respected people that you, uh, you know. Okay. And it yeah, so um, I don't know if he has worked with like Arduinos or microprocessors. Um, anytime anything involves a transistor, <laughs> I'm just like, oh my god, how do they work? And I'm like, oh, I'm to understand these things. And how do I put them in? And oh my goodness. Okay, yeah, but so much. generalize that a little bit. Um, you know, have you ever worked with something and just cannot wrap your brain around something that everyone else seems to get like instinctively? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I'm a programmer and system manager, whatever, and technology and stuff. And somehow I'm, one day people are going to find out that I'm helping run an open source project with people. And that, that, that's not, that shouldn't be allowed. <laughs> yeah. Fe feeling like any minute somebody is going to come and uh, tell you that you're not allowed to be doing what you're doing or that, uh, you know, like, oh my god, who the hell let me have the corporate annex? I mean, you know? Uh, yeah, I know. And like, we, we own the corporation. Everybody else is better at time managing their time and getting, and getting work done. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to put both my hands up here because, as I said, I was finishing the slides 10 minutes before the, uh, yeah. everyone else has better time management than I do. Yeah. Uh, my manager has some horrible habits, uh, i.e. committing directly to master uh, you know, on the live server. Uh, I know they're wrong, but I can't correct them. Yeah. Yeah. Feeling like you can't correct people who are above you because they're above you, and yeah. even when you know they're wrong, like especially when you know they're wrong. <laughs> okay. Oh, that's huge. Yeah, feeling like your success is due to luck and not due to anything that you did. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay. Yeah, feeling like not being able to ask for what you're worth. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Even though you're a mentor, you still feel like you know nothing. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's. Oh yeah. <laughs> And actually, that's why you should be mentoring. Because I know it sounds contradictory, but like the more that you work with other people and the more you find yourself teaching and stuff, uh, you know, it, it takes a while, but it does eventually. You start looking around and going, okay, well, you know, I've taught this like 7,000 times, and the people that I've taught it to seem to understand it. So obviously, I'm a good teacher, which means that I must know what I'm talking about. Yeah, huge, huge. In the back there. Yeah, I'm not a real developer. So I've got a story there. Actually, uh, when we started DreamWith, I was just going to be the business half. And I was going to do all of the, you know, talking to users and all the end user support and stuff. And Mark was going to do all the technical half. And then we realized that it was six weeks until we had announced our date for open beta. And we had something like uh, 70 massive things that we needed to get into those six weeks. And I said, well, you know, I can you know, go ahead and contribute a little bit. I mean, there's some of these are really tiny things. I'll just go ahead and like hack on those. And the next thing I knew, like six months later, I was actually the number three contributor to the code base. Ooh. And uh, at that point, I was, ev I was looking at this and I was still saying, well, I'm not really a developer. I'm just a business person. I'm just gonna, you know, I just like throw in a couple fixes every now and then. Yeah, that's really hard, is assessing, uh, you know, at what point do you say, well, yes, I am a developer. And, you know, from me to you, as someone else who has been there, if you are writing code, you are a developer. Yes. It does not matter if, you know, you are super ninja rock star programmer, but if you are writing, <laughs> if you are programming, you are a programmer. Anybody else? Um, everybody else has more passion and commitment for what they're doing and yeah, everybody else is more passionate than I am and more committed than I am. Yeah. And, 
Yeah, yeah um, again, look around and see how many people think that everybody else is more passionate and committed than they are. Um, the law of averages says at least most of you are wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I have to make no mistakes in public because I'm the only blank here. I'm the only woman here. I'm the only person oh. here. I'm the only yeah. X, Y, or Z here. Yes. I can't make mistakes because I am an example of my particular group. Yeah, that's big. Anybody else have one? I'm not a developer. I'm not really contributing. Oh, yeah. Oh. Not true. <laughs> I'm not a developer, so therefore I'm not really contributing. Can you expand that? Can you make it, I am not a blank? Therefore yeah. Not <laughs> I am not a blank, and therefore I am not contributing. Yeah, yeah that's, that's huge. And again, you know, as the project leaner and owner, everything is a contribution. I got laid off. Oh, my God, it's all true. Oh. <laughs> I got laid off, therefore it's all true. Yeah. Or that's, fired. Or fired, yeah. <laughs> I got criticized. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, well, last time uh, I ran this, somebody pointed out, and raised their hand and pointed out, um, I have heard of the Dunning-Kruger effect. Has anybody heard of the Dunning-Kruger effect, for those who don't know about it, is um, people who are um, highly, highly inexperienced or incompetent at something don't actually know how inexperienced or incompetent they are and are more likely to rate themselves as extremely experienced or extremely competent because they don't understand the scope of the problem. So the point that somebody was making was, I have heard of the Dunning-Kruger effect and therefore think that it applies to me. <laughs> <laughs> and worry constantly that I just don't know what I don't know. And I thought that was a really good one. Uh, I, I, I got the <laughs> that's, a good, that's a good bit of encouragement, yeah. <laughs> okay, so I think we're probably running uh, close to the end here because I see people hovering in the hallway. But um, thank you very much for attending and listening. And this, is, this is a topic I am incredibly passionate about and I care so much about. So if you want to have a conversation about it, Grab me in the hallway. We keep talking about it. Uh, you know, maybe an unconference session on Friday or whatever. I really love talking about this because I love seeing everybody else realizing that they're not the only one. So, thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.